very warm welcome to a very topical and pertinent theme currently, uh, one around health systems. We have a distinguished panel of guests this evening, Dr. Devi Shetty, Dr. Swati Piramal, and Dr. R.S. Sharma. I would like to briefly introduce the moderator for this session, Dr. Swati Piramal, after which I'd like Ma'am to take over and introduce the other two panelists and then proceed to moderating the session. Thank you very much for being here and a warm welcome again. Dr. Swati Piramal is the vice chairperson of the Piramal Group and amongst India's leading scientists and industrialists. She founded the Gopi Krishna Piramal Memorial Hospital in Mumbai and was instrumental in launching several pan-India public health campaigns and has authored several books on nutrition and health and also written public policy papers on topics such as patent protection, intellectual property, and data protection. She has also served as the first woman president of India's Apex Chamber of Commerce and is also a director of the Piramal Foundation. Dr. Piramal is a director on the board of Nestle India, Allegan India, and Essilor Luxottica. She is also a board member of Dean's Advisors to the Harvard Business School and the Harvard School of Public Health. She is the recipient of several awards, including the Padma Shri, the Knight of the Order of Merit, one of France's highest honors for medicine and trade. And she is also a winner of the Global Empowerment Award, awarded to her by Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent. <coughs> it is indeed a privilege to have all of you here. Uh, we only otherwise get an opportunity to listen to you on the news. Mm -hmm. And it is our privilege to have you all on the same forum. Thank you all again. And over to you, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you, Nafina. A very warm welcome to Dr. Aresh Sharma and also to Dr. Devi Shetty. I'd first like to introduce both of them. Uh, and before that, I thought that we should at least set up uh, a definition of what we are going to talk about today. Uh, and, and that word is very important, resilience. And resilience, uh, I was looking for a good definition from around all the papers in the world. And I found this one from The Lancet, that resilience is the ability of systems to mount a robust response to unforeseen, unpredicted, and unexpected demands, and to resume or even continue normal operations. As this uh, field is emerging in health sciences, we know about it in materials, but not so much in health sciences. I think it, it gives us the ability to look not at hindsight and to look at being what um, in military terms they call forehanded or upstream, looking at and solving problems before they happen. So we couldn't have two of the most famous people in India speaking on the subject. I first introduced Dr. K. S. R. S. Sharma. He is the CEO, National Health Authority is responsible for the Ayushman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana and the National Digital Health Mission. Dr. Sharma also serves as chairperson of the Empowered Group on Vaccine Administration, uh, and which is called COVIN. He was also inducted into the high-level vaccine administration panel headed by Dr. V.K. Paul, a member of the Niti Ayo, National Institution for Transforming India where he leads the health and nutrition vertical. As a founding director uh, and the director general and mission director of UIDAI, he helps formulate and launch Aadhaar, India's first and the world's largest biometric identity system. He also authored a book, uh, Making of Aadhaar, the world's largest identity platform, capturing his experiences. He's a member of the Indian Administrative Service IAS 1978 and the Jharkhand Welcome, Dr. Arish Sharma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pirambo. Uh, and then we have uh, perhaps the most famous doctor <laughs> of all time of India, Dr. Devi Shetty, the cardiac surgeon and chairman of the executive national director of Narayan Health, which he founded in 2000. He initiated the concept of a micro insurance scheme, which eventually led to the Karnataka government implementing the Yashvini program, 
a micro health insurance scheme for rural farmers. Dr. Shetty is professor of the Rajiv Gandhi University of Medical Sciences in Bangalore uh, and University of Minnesota Medical School in the USA. He's an active member of the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery since 1996 and a life member of the Indian Medical Association. He's a recipient of a number of awards and honors, most noteworthy being the Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan Awards. The Raj Yotsava Award in 2002, conferred by the government of Karnataka, um, the Outstanding Social Entrepreneurship Award by the Confederation of the Indian Industry, and the President's Award by the American College of Cardiology, and the Lifetime Achievement Award by Fiki. Now, this is just a short list because okay. I'm sure it will go into many pages. But I have to say one story before I invite Dr. Devi Shetty. I had a little girl from our teaching training college in Bhagad, Rajasthan, which is a village, and she had a heart condition. And when she came to Mumbai, I went from doctor to doctor, hospital to hospital, to find out if somebody could treat this condition. And everyone put up their hands and said they couldn't do it. And when I took her finally to Dr. Devi Shetty, uh, you know, he did the surgery so well that today that little girl is, uh, is become a, a really grown up and a really proud human being of what has been achieved for her medically. Um, thank you, Dr. Devi Shetty, for all the work you do on behalf of all the thousands and millions of patients. I have to say thank you for the work that you do. Thanks. And I want to invite you both to, to you know, comment about the, the first question. And that is, if we are to do resilience, we are to do public health, how do we anticipate the adverse event? How do we then look at it as an unforeseen event and then how do we adapt to it and then how do we come back to normal of course the it systems and technology are going to be a big driver of our uh, response to adverse events and dr R. S. sharma has done so much work in the national digital health mission i thought i'd direct the first question to him uh, you know saying prime minister's advice was always use technology uh, to to beat adverse events and how has he done that? And how will he do that? Thank you very much, Dr. P. Raman, for your uh, question and for a wonderful and very generous introduction. Uh, and I really feel privileged to be in the company of Dr. Devi Shetty and, and, and you. It's, it's a real, real privilege because I am simply a bureaucrat. I've just been doing my you know job as, a, as an officer of the government of India and the state government. So I really, and you people have done something really really outstanding you know so so i hats off to you and to your contribution to the society and the country uh, well uh, as you rightly said uh, technology uh, is is a driver but i must say technology is not a driver technology is merely an enabler technology enables to do many things better than what we could do them otherwise so that's one part but normally, obviously, health care is a matter of real bricks and mortar, you know, Narayan Hridayalaya or the other institutions who are really delivering, you know, health services. There, there are many things which technology can enable, but there are many things which obviously technology cannot do. Operations, obviously, technology cannot do. Operations can certainly be aided. Of course, now you have 5G coming so that you can have a remote surgeries, but that's that's a far away idea as far as we are concerned in India here. And I think the three major, you know, ingredients or major, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, attributes of a good health system, which is accessibility, affordability, and of course, the, the third part, which is the, the quality. They are they are very essential and they can be done uh, with the with the physical health infrastructure. My is you know I I am really among the doctors I am basically a very fudgy kind of doctor I am I've done my PhD I have not had any anything to do with the health systems and this is the first time in my life that I am working in a in a health area but I do believe that in many sectors including health we can 
create uh, situations, we can create platforms which can reduce the cost of medical services. We can actually make it more accessible even to the rural areas and we can certainly improve the quality also. Uh, for affordability part, I must say that, you know, the government of India has done under the Ayushman Bharat. We are trying to help poor people to provide them, you know, subsidy and help and, and insurance cover to ensure that the, the uh, health episodes do not become uh, such, such catastrophic in their, uh, you know, sort of lives so as to push them into, into the, the pit of poverty that we are doing. But more importantly, what the Honorable Prime Minister under their, his Digital India mission has done during the last seven, eight years is really phenomenal. Uh, let me begin by saying that there are very, very unique utilities, digital public goods, which this country has created. And there are no parallels anywhere. And, you know, I look like I'm boasting because everyone looks at the West, you know, where, what people in England or what people in US have done. Nobody realizes what India has done. So, for example, the digital identity system which India has created, which called Aadhaar, which has 1.29 billion holders, that ID system is, is so versatile that it can be plugged into any digital transaction. Now, that's that's very, very important, you know, to understand. You can deliver digital, you know, electronic KYCs. The doctor can digitally sign a prescription without, you know, sort of signing it by, by his pen or whatever. And that's so much required uh, for, for, you know, digital delivery of prescriptions, for example. So the, then you have the consent framework, which is so much required for, you know, medical records and health records and privacy framework. So and, and you have a digital locker where we today have four billion, you know, documents. And India has created a very, very unique payment platform because for every digital transaction, you require payments. You know, when you teleconsult a doctor and that you will have to pay the fees and you can't pay the fees in cash. So basically, you have the unified payment interface, UPI, which is doing three billion transactions a month. Now, now these are all enablers. These are all digital public goods which have been created and which will be used by any digital system, any digital delivery system. Fortunately, we also have a very robust now digital connectivity infrastructure. We have 1.2 billion mobile connections. We have, you know, 700 billion internet users in this country, 600 billion, you know, smartphones in this country, growing at the rate of 25 million every quarter. So these are all building blocks which on which you can create a platform and the national digital health mission, which which the Honorable Prime Minister launched on last 15th August. And we did it in six union territories, uh, which which actually and, and this one year we have perfected the building blocks of of that mission, which is the registry of the health facilities, registry of the doctor, health professional registry of laboratories and, and the electronic health records, personal health records, all these things have been built, telemedicine tele, tele uh, kind of rules, etc. So I think what is going to happen is a similar, you know, transformation I visualize in the use of technology in delivery of health services as probably Aadhaar has done in the digitization of the entire landscape in our country and i think that's where i my my strength or my capability or my understanding lies i don't understand health domain as such but i what i do understand is that ict information and communication technology has become quite permeable and can be leveraged in any domain whatsoever including the health domain and that's what precisely what we will try to do and that will probably create what you you know initially thought you know resilient health delivery system, you know, for example, India built COVID, we built COVID in six, you know, January itself and 16 January Prime Minister launched the program. COVID has grown to 500 million, you know, uh, uh, users in just about six months, though, though uh, that, that's the way it is. So I, th I think we, we do have the wherewithal to build such platforms. 
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sharma. I can uh, personally verify that idea because, uh, you know, our foundation, which is called the Piramal Foundation, we use Amrit uh, accessible medical records via integrated technology, which is NDHM compliant. And we use it in states like Assam, Andhra Pradesh. The whole, every village uh, is got electronic medical records today. It works to have frontline healthcare workers and primary healthcare workers delivery, which is, of course, uh, not as good as it should be in our country. But it, it helps data analytics, helps the government. The chief minister on his dashboard can see where there is an outbreak of any infection or any epidemic or something immediately uh, in a few minutes. And that, uh, I think, has created close to 1 million data points captured, healthline, health wellness, primary health care centers, and telemedicine. So you're absolutely right. You have built the infrastructure, and it is private foundations or other people who will climb on top of that and use that to do good. And that is, I think, uh, one of the biggest benefits. So Dr. De Devi Shetty, you have also created so much public good. And one of the questions repeatedly asked is, how can we build that culture of accountability? Uh, we have uh, seen many issues during the COVID pandemic, including oxygen shortages, or shortages of doctors, or shortages of medical people in the right place at the right time. Uh, and how do we build this culture across the nation? I remember you wrote an amazing article in Times of India on how to rapidly deploy one million healthcare workers. And I see that other countries have followed your idea quite well and are implementing. And so I'd like you to please say how you do it, of course, in one institution, but how do you do it across the country? The culture of learning, adaptability, and accountability. I feel that the way India handled COVID pandemic is a classic example of how to implement all these three uh, important uh, uh, requirements. PD, it's very interesting. We always look at now we are retrospective analyzing what is the mortality in India, what's the mobility, and we compare with England, we compare with Germany, US. But people forget what is the population of India? What is the population of England? The England population is slightly less than Karnataka state population. Right? So how do you compare when few million people develop COVID and they land in front of the hospital? I want to know which health system in the world can adapt themselves to manage it. But when you look at all the limitations what we have, uh, we have done remarkably well. Remarkably well. And this is a typical example of uh, uh, how India is learning and adapting itself. But going forward, I believe that India, Indian healthcare system will become the first healthcare system in the world which will dissociate healthcare from affluence. India will prove to the world that the wealth of the nation has nothing to do with the quality of healthcare its citizens can enjoy. And India will do it in a short period of time. You will be surprised, uh, Swati, I can tell you, in the next five years, when you enter Indian hospitals, there will be a huge reception without receptionist. Receptionists will be working remotely. There will be large ICUs with no intensivist. Intensivists will be at home managing 50 bed, 100 bed ICUs. And there will not be people running around with a sam blood sample or a syringe or a file. There will be robots which will be doing all this work. And all these things are going to happen in India in the next five years. So if you talk about uh, the, the adaptability of a health system to adapt itself for the changing needs, we are an example now and even in the future. I have no doubt about it. Because you have to first ask yourself how much money you spend for delivering this type of healthcare and compare this with any other country in the world, including the developing country. You look at the cost of delivering healthcare in that part of the world and our part of the world. 
for the money we spend and what we get it is mind boggling so essentially we are an example for others to follow the example of how adaptable and how accountable we are for human life thank you dr shukla so that brings to mind the idea of equity you said that uh, very important idea that every indian will get uh, good medical care and whether he is from a remote area from a tribal area or from a city uh, the access will be equitable using technology that dr sharma talked about but my worry is one more thing uh, both of you is that you know uh, you after independence we have one of the lowest spending uh, in healthcare in the world perhaps per capita and we must invest in it we must invest in healthcare the covid-19 pandemic has shown us more than any other time in the history of our country that healthcare is important that doctors are important and i raise my hand in salute to the doctors and nurses and on the foreground on the front line been battling for one and a half years uh, for this covid pandemic uh, but please can we invest more and does india really need much more than it spends so that we can really get equity we works are in the tribal areas of india where every indicator is less than what it is in the city whether it's infant mortality maternal mortality these are forgotten people these are 100 million people who are live in the tribal areas so remote that doctors can't get there and how do we ensure equitable access uh, we have started so the tribal health collaborative with the piramal foundation rockefeller the bill and melinda gates foundation in across india to to reach these people who i believe are forgotten by the healthcare system and how can we then get equity uh, you know across india Uh, Dr. Shetty, uh, 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 the Swati, I agree with you that as a country we need to spend money, more money on healthcare. There is no doubt about it. But my observation, you talk about the tribal people deprived of healthcare. Why? Because when the city is short of doctors, which doctor will go to tribal area? So we have. definitely scaled up our medical education but we are 1.3 billion people so when you put that number the number what you need we need at least a million doctors at least 2 million nurses so by putting money and building more hospitals having more icu beds beds do not treat patients we need doctors nurses and medical technicians so essentially we need to relook at how the doctors nurses technicians are trained unless we do that we will never be able to even if you double the uh, the spend on the healthcare there won't be people because ultimately tribal area requires a hospital hospital requires doctors nurses and technicians when the city themselves are starved of these people why will anybody go there then what will happen is all of a sudden the salary will shoot up everything becomes unviable so we really need to as a country we need to come up with out of the box solutions for training doctors nurses paramedics and everyone now isn't it possible it is possible i can we produce 24 million babies a year if you tell me that you know we can, don't we don't have that many doctors that means we haven't used out of the box solutions to train them See the the every hospital with over hundred beds should become a institute to train nurses. Nurses are not trained in the classroom. Nurses are trained bedside. But unfortunately, our education system doesn't allow where the training should happen for the training to be offered. So we need to relook at these issues. If we can do that. Believe me, I'll give an example. If you want to double the number of doctors, all we have to do is ask the existing medical colleges to adopt one district headquarters hospital and take double the number of students, finish the preclinical in their existing campus. Indian medical colleges have the world's most luxurious campuses with 20 acres. 
which even medical college in uh, London, the guys hospital medical school doesn't have. It's in four acres of land. So we can easily double the number of intake and for clinical work, they should go to a district hospital. So district hospital will become a medical college hospital. First thing what happens is the quality of healthcare delivered in the district hospital will tremendously improve because there are a lot of young doctors who want to learn and they cannot learn unless they treat the patients. The, 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 all these district hospitals will all of a sudden become vibrant. And it is a vibrancy which changes the dynamics of healthcare. It is the young people who will breathe fresh life into these hospitals. So we can do amazing things if only we come up with out of the box solution to train doctors, nurses, and technicians. First thing is every council uh, who is the guardian of training medical uh, doctors, nurses, technicians, they should be given a target by the government that we this is the shortage. You figure out how to train them. That's all. Without compromising on the quality, it is the duty of the councils to produce enough number of doctors, nurses, technicians for the safe health uh, care delivery of the country. I couldn't agree with you more, Dr. Shetty. And I'd like to offer an example of my own. I just joined a new uh, European board called Essilor Luxottica, which is based in Paris and Italy. And they work all over the world. I was staggered by one number. They said that India has 300 million people with uncorrected refractive error. And I think about it, I said that you know requires an optometrist. It doesn't require any invasive procedure to see your glasses to, for the elderly, for schools. And yet our training, which is in classroom, is moved from one year to two years. Now, we should be moving in the other way. We should be saying all this should be done digital especially in tribal areas and aspirational areas and can we move the government to do the opposite of increasing in classroom training and in, in fact uh, uh, you know be creative and say we can't have something like this children doing badly in school because they can't see the elderly uh, you know living a life which they can't can't see truck drivers you know can't drive properly have accidents and things like that so I mean, here's just one example where we went in the reverse direction. And how do we use technology? Now I'm so glad, Dr. Sharma, that uh, because of COVID, we can actually sign digitally, as you say. Uh, before, we couldn't do that. We could not prescribe a medicine uh, digitally. And how will these kind of changes help in equity? How will they do what uh, Dr. Devi Shetty calls an outer box? How will we never have shortages again of medical personnel? Uh, how well, I think uh, I think what Dr. Devi Shetty has said and what you have said, I really have very little to add to, you know, the way we should go about it. I completely agree with him that the numbers are staggering. And actually, when you start comparing, you don't understand these numbers. You know, they are millions. We are billions. So, so yes. that makes the entire uh, yeah. you know dynamics change. Yes. But but I completely agree that you know this this is. This is also an advantage. Let's not look at the numbers as a very disadvantaged situation. You know, Dr. Devi Shetty has always believed in the economies of scale on the healthcare system. And you know, that's that's tremendously an advantage. And, and therefore, the solutions, India has always been a country of, of, you know, large numbers and very low value, low value, high volume. Yes. You are, do you know that the average recharge of a prepaid telephone, how much is the amount? <laughs> rupees 10. <laughs> 10 rupees is the average recharge. I was chairman of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India before I joined the post and it was 10 rupees. I was surprised. 10 rupees to niche gir jayega to hum log uthayenge bhi nahi usko. This is the situation. So basically, but 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 we make it. You know, we are having 3 billion UPI transaction and each transaction is just about average 200 rupees. 200 rupees is barely three dollars so essentially what is required is for us the solutions also have to be unique the solutions also have to be frugal the solutions also have to be scalable they have to be interoperable so i think these are some of the attributes we must do and that actually will require a completely different way of thinking than the current way of usual thinking you know of of the numbers in that manner I am very sure that the technology will 
you know, what will technology do? One couple of things. One is it will remove the information asymmetry. You know, imagine in the COVID times when you had oxygen cylinder problem, then everybody was running helter and skelter. But you did not run helter and skelter for vaccination because there was a very robust system and we have done 500 million vaccinations, more than 500 million vaccinations. And absolutely each person's digital record is available on the platform. You can download the certificate. So basically, information asymmetry removal is one part. Secondly, connectivity will be used. For example, the refractive index issue which you gave. There are now technologies available where you can actually figure out the defective AIs using mobile phones and using very, 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 very inexpensive devices. And those must be, you know, kind of promoted. So I think we must promote innovation. We must promote the, the, the use of technology. And, and I think there is a whole set of people in this country who can innovate and who can bring out appropriate you know, it was a long time back called appropriate technology. I would not yes. use that word because that word has become old. But I think out of the box solutions, as Dr. Shetty rightly pointed out, I think if we use that, that paradigm, many of the problems can be resolved. And we have shown that we can create scalable solutions. We can create speedy solutions. We can we can really do wonders when, when such need arises. It, there, I have no doubt in the capability of the system. It can deliver, provided we create a good system. That's the need. Yeah. Well, I couldn't agree with you more uh, as a proud member of the Indian pharmaceutical industry. The prices of our drugs are even lower than <laughs> that of your rupees 10. Yes. So we, uh, I think we have served the country well during this pandemic in making our own vaccines and also many of the medicines required. So Swati, Swati, sorry for interruption. Yeah. I wanted one of the very effective antibiotic yeah. and uh, I got the slide with one of the expensive antibiotic and one egg and one banana. <laughs> and among the three, the antibiotic is the cheapest. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right, sir. You know, you know what it is. So, you know, having said that, I think the role of the Indian private sector played a huge part in the COVID pandemic. Uh, producing uh, the so many million vaccines that were all, you know, private sector effort and uh, producing all the different medicines from steroids to infleximab to many were all produced in double quick time. There was no shortage of it at all. And uh, we are very proud of that effort. Uh, and so what is the role of the private sector, Dr. Shetty? What can we do to amplify what Dr. Sharma said? We need innovation. We need frugal innovation. We need to reach the farthest and most remotest area with very simple but effective medical solutions. And what would the role of the private sector be in that, uh, Miley? The nearly 60% of the healthcare delivery of the country is managed today by the private sector, nearly 60%. Now, what we really need to do as a very effective uh, section of the society which can address the country's needs. First thing is, we have to look at five years, ten years ahead, what needs to be done. I'll give you one example. Uh, we need to do close to two million heart operations in a year. Uh, right? The, and we are doing about one and a half lakh heart operation. Out of that, 14% is done by us. So there is something wrong. So we need to scale up. So essentially, I personally feel that if we want to see a better future in healthcare for India, private sector should go for a large scale adoption of digital medical records. And this digital medical records should be available to every patient in their own phone. And it should be totally uh, portable. They can go to any healthcare system in the country and they should be able to get their medical records. And that is possible. And there is no point in everyone designing their own EMR, a standard one or two, three EMR, and everyone subscribes to it. And I can tell you, if, the, if we give a substitute for pen and paper in the doctors of hands and uh, nurses, nurses' hands, mortality in the hospital will go down significantly. 
and mo mortality morbidity will go down secondly the accessibility will improve significantly because for every cough headache patient doesn't have to see a doctor personally we have close to 70 million diabetics and there are hardly a few hundred diabetologists now if you go for a large scale diabetic clinic management online diabetic clinic management we can have a very very effective diabetes management online and we have proven that the blood sugar control of a patient who is managed online is better than a patient who insists on visiting the doctor so essentially our advantage as private sector is we have the freedom of adaptability and freedom of change whereas a government always runs in a rigid structure coming up with the innovation in a government hospital is extremely hard whereas in a private sector we have the freedom to change so i think one good thing is the 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 difference between private and the government is becoming very very uh, uh, the the it's not as distinct as it was before it is getting diluted and lot of the state governments are now working closely with the uh, the private sector that's a good thing but on the whole i personally feel that if we liberate the rigid structure of uh, medical nursing paramedical education allow large scale adoption of medical education as part of a healthcare delivery system if every healthcare every hospital becomes a center for training the future doctors nurses technicians within 5 years we would have uh, reached our target of dissociating healthcare from affluence it is possible but for this to happen we need large scale digital adoption and reforms major major reforms liberation of education no you're right sir in fact uh, just as an example the piramal foundation works with governments assam andhra pradesh for national digital health records amrit and it's an open source platform and as a foundation a private foundation we can do the experiment we can do the work and then we can give it to the governments to adopt in an open source way and that has resulted in amazing dashboards being from every village going straight to the health minister to the chief minister within minutes and uh, i'm very happy to say that more and more states are adopting uh, digital electronic medical records and this whole doctor in a box concept which you said out of the box but can we get the doctor in a box concept in the remotest areas uh, you know tribal areas where actually everything can be done digitally and really that improves maternal and infant mortality we proved it in the district of araku where maternal mortality is zero since the last 3 years and then we have tried to uh, do this all over the country so <laughs> this is exactly the model that you are talking about that the collaboration between private and public healthcare systems is is now dissolving with a lot of corporates taking up this national mission of health literacy so let's talk a bit about the um, sdg 3 targets um, you know we know that we are far behind uh, the uh, sdg goals and uh, it means well being for all ages uh, being declared declared at the alma at a uh, you know a celebration uh, of health and what can we do to you know we are, if you are behind how are we going to get there get to the race get to the finish line uh, because we have to somehow put everything into place let's take for example infant and maternal mortality sickle cell anemia is anemia in women 70% of women have anemia and why can't we do these all preventable diseases and how can we just make sure that we reach those goals very quickly uh, we'll have to increase the pace now uh, to reach that goal so how can we do it and using whatever ideas you have would be great uh, dr sharma pas well uh, uh, let me uh, you know give me the allow me to add to what dr shetty had uh, mentioned in the previous uh, just now introduction i think uh, what is important is that while it is it is absolutely true that the private sector will have to play an extremely important role in the delivery of health services uh, you know they are doing now also as you said rightly 
and, and they will continue to uh, do that. Uh, what is important is actually a true partnership between the government and the private sector. And how do you make that happen? So one which we, you know, the, the digital health platform, which one is talking about, you see, you have digital solutions currently. And, and Dr. Piramal said that, you know, how the dashboard and how the digital health records are being collected and how the data points are being generated. Now, what is going to happen is if you have, let's say these systems are all silo systems, you know, for example, one MG delivers medicines, delivers, you know, drugs, then they have their own doctors, they have their no doctors prescribed. So everybody is building an end to end digital solutions come today. What is required is actually to have an interoperable digital platform. And, and let me explain what it is meant by that. You know, let's let's talk of e-commerce digital platform. So you have uh, Amazon and you have, a uh, let's say, Flipkart or whatever. Now, they basically, if you want to sell it on Amazon, you have to come become a seller on Amazon and you have to have an Amazon application and you can purchase and do the transaction on Amazon platform. They themselves have developed a currency, whatever, Amazon Pay or Amazon Pay balance or whatever. So this is and, and what these platforms do, basically these platform, digital platforms have a tendency of having a winner all situation where, you know, you remember Facebook is there today. There used to be a platform called Orkut some time back. People have forgotten that because essentially these platforms have that network effect and they continue to, uh, you know, demolish everybody and anybody and they become singular monopolies. Now, if you want to, you know, tackle that situation and what we want to do, we want to create a, a level playing field platform, not a platform which is which is discretionary. Today, you know, you, you see the difference which is happening in government and the platforms and, and kind of disputes which are arising. They are arising because they are all, you know, become too powerful. They have become too monopolistic. So what is required is government there has a role to play in creating a digital platform where you can discover, you can use any front end solution, any front end application, and you can go to any doctor or you can search the doctor, you can search a pharmacy, you can search a, a solution. So that's, and you can search even the, even the digital, uh, digital solutions. So what this national digital health mission does very briefly, a, we have horizontal utilities like Aadhaar, payment systems, etc. Then on top of that, we have the digital, you know, domain utilities, which are essentially drug registries, registries of the doctors, registries of the laboratories, registries of, of the pharmacies, etc. And on top of that, you have what is called unified health interface. That's what we are visualizing, similar to unified payment interface. And then on top of that, you will have applications. So that will create a complete grid where private sector and public sector will be able to seamlessly participate, number one. Number two, the electronic health record, the personal health record, people will be able to keep in their mobiles or, or you know, they, they will be, they will be uh, you know, transferable in the sense that they will be portable. So the portability is also very important. So you can go from place A to place B and your medical records, you are access, they are accessible. Either you can keep them on the phone, but if you don't want to keep them on the phone, there should be a system where they should be accessible from place A to place B. So therefore, I think, to, to, to think of that kind of situation. And today, India as a country is capable of building that because we have certain digital public utilities which enable the creation of such platform. No other country can do it, believe, believe me. So I think that is something which we, we need to focus on. And I'm very happy to have interacted with many of, of you, uh, you know, from the medical fraternity, from the hospital people and they have all been very excited at this idea and I think we will take it forward with your support and I think the public private partnership is extremely extremely important and and we should we should really do it this way only thank you dr Ar dr sharma you've really given us the uh, most important agenda of collaboration of doing things together uh, as achieving this national mission and dr shetty can we wrap up with your three most important points for resilience in healthcare systems. Okay. <laughs> the, the, thank you. Thank you, Swati. <clears throat> As I said, let's hope and pray to God that there will not be a, another uh, five years, ten years down the line, COVID-like epidemic. But if it happens, what we need to do now 
to overcome that. If the, 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 as a country with the over a billion population, we need to double or triple the number of institutions which can train the medical manpower. That is the most important thing. Second, no paper and pen should be used in delivering healthcare. Everything has to be digital. And the third is the, uh, the, the possibility of doubling the number of critical care beds. Because we believe that what holds the country for ransom is the lack of uh, critical care beds with the trained medical manpower. We should assume that at any time a thing like this happens, will the country be able to mobilize that many beds, monitors, people to uh, manage it? And we will have, by the grace of God, at least five to ten years time to prepare. And a country like ours can easily prepare. I have no doubt about it. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. So three words, people, together, and technology. Yes. I think that sort of sums up uh, the idea of resilience. Thank you so much uh, to the Daj Foundation and uh, for inviting us. And we've had a delightful conversation. Uh, thank you for spending time to our two panelists who are amazing. Uh, Napina. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all for such an evocative session on resilient health systems. It kept me engrossed. And I have so many notes on interoperable digital platforms and health grid and unified health interfaces. Um, I think it was an inspiring session that traversed technology, identity, and accountability. I think your discussion also provided very pragmatic but optimistic perspectives on um, you know, some of the ideas that our attendees can build on. Um, thank you, ma'am, for your thought-provoking questions that I think triggered many of these amazing insights. Um, thank you, Dr. Shetty. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. It was indeed an excellent session. Thank you. Thank you all the participants for making the time to attend today's session. We will see you in the morning at 9 a.m. when we begin with a session titled An Institutional Approach to Sustainable Development. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Switch it off. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful meeting you, Dr. Shetty. And I think we'll, inshallah, meet someday in person. Yes. And we'll, we'll look forward to it. <laughs> together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.